new series beginning today, the Sermon on the Amount. Here's a series in a sentence. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also, Matthew 6 and verse 21. You can tell a whole lot about the heart of a person by what one treasures. You can hide many things, but you cannot hide where your heart is. It is good to understand the basics of biblical economics, and Jesus provides that for us in Luke 16, 1 to 13. He loved to teach via parables, hard lessons broken down into biteable pieces. Here's his parable. There was a rich man whose manager was accused of wasting his possessions. So he called him in and asked him, what is this I hear about you? Give an account of your management because you cannot be manager any longer. The manager said to himself, what shall I do now? My master has taken away my job. I'm not strong enough to dig, and I'm ashamed to beg. I know what I'll do so that when I lose my job here, people will welcome me into their houses. So he called in each one of his master's debtors, and he asked the first, How much do you owe my master? 800 gallons of olive oil, he replied. The manager told him, Take your bill, sit down, and quickly make it 400. Then he asked the second, And how much do you owe? A thousand bushels of wheat, he replied. He told him, Take your bill and make it 800. The master commended the dishonest manager because he had acted shrewdly. For the people of this world are more shrewd in dealing with their own kind than are the people of light. I tell you, use worldly wealth to gain friends for yourself, so that when it is gone, you will be welcome into eternal dwellings. Whoever can be trusted with very little can be trusted with much, and whoever is dishonest with very little will also be dishonest with much. So if you have not been trustworthy in handling worldly wealth, who will trust you with true riches? And if you have not been trustworthy with someone else's property, who will give you property of your own? No servant can serve two masters. Either he will hate the one and love the other, or he will be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve both God and money. Now, this is a problem parable. It appears to be saying something good about deceitful scheming. The man was being commended, but not for being deceitful, but being shrewd, clever, wise about money. The steward was like a CPA or a manager who was caught being wasteful and he was fired and he was given some time before departing his job. Now that's not going to happen today because today you're fired and you are escorted out. He was worried about his future income. So he begins working on a solution. He goes to his clients and he makes deals. His boss found out, and he's impressed with the scheme. Hey, I've got to hand it to you. Smart move. Well, you know, we get so engrossed in the evil activity in this parable that we miss the thrust of what Jesus is teaching. And what is Jesus saying? What is his principle? When it comes to money, you better be clever. Better understand how it works. You better have a plan. Let's break it down. Let's talk about being financially wise. Verses 3 through 7 of this parable. Now the steward realized he had a problem. Verse 3. We miss this and it's tragic. Most people live like they don't really have a financial problem. The steward knew that denial wouldn't get it done. A wise person sees the problem. The steward of Luke 16 is evil, but... He's wise. 
Our problem is we mistakenly believe that if we're righteous in one area, we can afford to be careless, perhaps, in another area. We live in a world that is money-driven. It's prudent to know how it works. How much money is in your savings account? Take a look at the chart. 44.5% of Americans don't have a savings account at all. 28.5% have maybe upwards to 1,000. 8.9 have upwards to 5,000. 2.2 have upwards to 10,000. 13.8 have more than 10,000. We need to note this because perhaps we're only just a few bad breaks away from being broke. I want to say something about my brother. Growing up, my brother was my hero. He was great in math and understanding how things worked mechanically. He did well in school. With less than a degree, though, he got a job with the government programming computers. He was really good. Got a security clearance because he was working on military projects. But he made some very bad choices. He chose the wrong friends and started using LSD. And he came home from a business trip from New Orleans, and his life was unraveled. He was never the same. He lost his job. He was even homeless for several years before finding his way back to Michigan. His income is only a little higher than $1,000 a month. He made some bad decisions, but he doesn't blame anyone. I have a great deal of respect for him because he lives on what he has. He's got a budget. We go over it a few times a year. He's, he's even given me $900 in the past several months to put it back for him. He manages. My sister and her husband, as well as Mary and I, have helped him from time to time. But he never asks for money. Never. We see a need and we take care of it. A few years back, I was able to purchase Ann Hotchkiss's 20-year-old car and give it to him. And it's still running. Well, the steward in her story had to come up with some possible solutions. Plan A, you know, maybe he could dig ditches. He says, no, 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 I'm, I'm, I'm too old, too out of shape. Plan B is, you know, maybe I can start begging, but he just was too proud to beg. Plan C is, hey, I'll come up with a scheme. I'll figure out a way to take care of this problem. The point is the steward took action, verses 4 and following. He had guts. He didn't wallow in his plight. He acted. That's what the Lord is commending. He did something. Some of us get into a jam and just freeze. We quit. This man was no Sunday school teacher, but he is smart about money. We can learn from him. We can learn from people in the world and know how to handle money. Well, there's some kingdom keys we need to be familiar with. Verses 8 and 9. The text says that he acted shrewdly. Jesus is saying when it comes to money, the evil man knew the system. Knew how to make it work for him to get ahead. Shrewd. How many times have you asked the Lord to give you wisdom when it comes to money? Not to scheme, but to use money for your advantage. The text also says in verse 8 that he, Jesus said to use worldly wealth to gain friends so that when it is gone, mm, you'll be welcomed by people. Pay attention to this because it's a difficult passage. And sometimes we walk away without gaining the insight. Look at this spiritually. We can bless people here on earth in a way that they will applaud us when they see us in heaven. Spiritually, thinking here is about thinking about our actions and how they affect our experience in heaven. The difference between the world and the kingdom is the world uses money to impress. 
or as in the kingdom we use money to bless. Let's talk about economic relationships in the kingdom. Verse 10 says, whoever can be trusted. Trust, you see, is the issue. Money is a trust. We manage a little or a lot, but it must be seen as a trust. You remember the prodigal son of Luke chapter 15? The prodigal son failed because he just didn't have a budget. That's it. He just blew his money not thinking about the future. A wise person is open to financial advisors, to mentors, and of course, the Lord. Solomon points to the ant in Proverbs chapter 6. He says, go to the ant, you sluggard. Consider its ways and be wise. It has no commander, no overseer, no ruler. Yet it stores its provision in summer and gathers its food at harvest. How long will you lie there, you sluggard? When will you get up from your sleep? A little sleep, a little slumber, a little folding of the hands to rest. And poverty will come upon you like a bandit and scarcity like an armed man. What's your plan? The basic plan I was taught early on was give the Lord 10% top cut. Save 10% and manage the rest. The other extreme, of course, is the words of Proverbs 23 and verse 4 says, Do not wear yourself out to be rich. Have the wisdom to show restraint. Balance. Balance is the key. Well, part of our trust is tested in the way that we give to the Lord. In Luke 6, 38, Jesus says, Give, and it will be given to you a good measure, pressed down, shaken together, running over, it will be poured into your lap. Or with the measure that you use, it will be measured to you. If God isn't Lord at all, of all, He is not Lord at all. Giving is a test, a test of the trust given to us. Put your money where it will appreciate, not depreciate. There was Winston Churchill who said, we make a living by what we make, but we make a life by what we give. Of course, the real lesson in all this from verses 11 to 13 is that the most important commodity in the whole world is people. So if you've not been trustworthy in handling worldly worth, well, who will trust you with true riches? We cannot be entrusted with people if we fail to handle the less important commodity of money. That's undergrad course 101. Money. Graduate course 404 is people. 1 Timothy chapter 3 lists the qualities of elders. Five of those qualities deal with money. There's only room for one master in our lives, according to verse 13. No servant can serve two masters. Either he will hate the one and love the other, or he'll be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve both God and money. That just might be the most important lesson we can learn in this life. Well, here's the deal. I love this story. Albert. Alexander Hyde, 1848-1935. He was born in a small town in Massachusetts. Later in his life, he would move to um, Levensworth, Kansas, where he secured a job as a bank clerk. He did well, and they transferred him to Wichita, Kansas, to open up a branch. But on the side, he started dabbling in the real estate market, and he got caught up in a boom market. He quit his bank job and rode the wave of the boom. But in 1889, the market collapsed, and Hyde was in deep trouble. 
He was a hundred thousand dollars in debt with zero income. Now, a hundred thousand dollars then is equal to two million eight hundred and thirty one thousand two hundred and thirty nine dollars today. He prayed about a situation. And he vowed to God that he would give the Lord 10% of whatever he made from that day forth. No matter what, whether he could pay his bills or not pay his bills, the Lord was getting 10%. Friends and family criticized him for making such a pledge because he was so far behind with his bills. He responded that he had to take care of his first debt, his debt to Almighty God. He got out of debt. He started a new company. A company that made laundry and toilet soap and shaving cream. And later, it would come up with a cough syrup. And while he was developing this, he, he invented, he came up with this um, ointment called menthol. And it would become big. He had operations in Wichita and also in Buffalo, New York. In a clever move, he, he gave away menthol products to missionaries in the field all over the world. And then the demand for that menthol began to grow. He became fabulously wealthy. And he never forgot his vow to God. He died January 10, 1935, having learned a valuable lesson about life and money. He simply made God first. Lord willing, we'll continue this next time. Let's pray. Father, thank you for your word and the way that it uncomplicates the complicated, infuse in us a keen insight uh, in the realm of finances. Give us a desire to know the system and your principles. Help us to evaluate our personal finances and the good work of this church. For Jesus' sake, we pray. Amen.